Recall that we've encountered a few techniques to find formulas for various sequences. But how can we be sure that these formulas hold for every single value of n? For example, consider the sum of squares sequence s sub n, given by s sub n equals the sum of the first n squares. We've encountered two different ways to discover a closed formula for s sub n. The first one, a so-called proof without words, uses the geometry of a stack of squares. We can use three copies of a stack of squares to create a rectangle. One copy of the stairs creates this tower, the other copy creates the left side of the rectangle, and another copy creates the right side of the rectangle. We use this rectangle to show that the sum of the first n squares is equal to n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all over 6. The second technique was to use the sequences of differences. We've filled in this table to notice that the sequence of third differences is constant, so that the sum of squares is a degree 3 polynomial, and then we used polynomial fitting to find the coefficients, so that the sum of squares is 1 third n cubed plus 1 half n squared plus 1 six n. These are both the same formula, but is it clear that these formulas will always give the correct value for the sum of squares? One technique to prove these kinds of formulas is known as the technique of mathematical induction. Recall that the formal law of inference known as modus ponens states that if you know p implies q and you know p, then you must also know q. So we have the formal inference that p implies q and p formally implies q. The principle of mathematical induction is a technique that utilizes modus ponens to prove statements of the form for all n greater than or equal to n zero p of n, where p of x is some predicate. The technique takes the proposition we want to prove for all n greater than or equal to n zero p of n and splits it into two separate steps. The first step is to prove p of n zero. This is called the base case. It is a single proposition. The second step is called the inductive step. And this is a proof of a universal followed by a conditional statement. So we have to prove for all n greater than or equal to n zero, p of n implies p of n plus one. For example, Suppose we want to prove the statement that 4 evenly divides 5 to the n minus 1 for all n greater than or equal to 0. To use the technique of induction, we first prove 5 to the 0 minus 1 is evenly divisible by 4, and then we prove the universal statement that for all n greater than or equal to 0, if 4 evenly divides 5 to the n minus 1, then 4 divides the quantity 5 raised to the n plus 1 minus 1. Before we learn how to write proofs by induction, let's first verify that induction works by seeing it as a waterfall of modus ponens. The induction step is actually a universal conditional statement. This means that it represents infinitely many conditional statements as pictured here. Unfortunately, none of these conditional statements mean anything until we satisfy one of the hypotheses. But the base case does just that. The base case satisfies the first hypothesis, and when we couple that with the first conditional statement, we get p1 by modus ponens. But now that we know p1, we can couple that with the second conditional statement to get p2 by modus ponens. Now this process can be continued indefinitely. We can use the newly created proposition with the next conditional to find the next proposition, and we've created a cascading waterfall of modus ponens. For instance, say we wanted to know if p of 100 is true. Then we can just run this process until we actually get to p100. And we can keep going. We can use this modus ponens cascade to get all the way down to p of 500 if we want. We can even go much larger. You should be able to convince yourself that given any positive integer n, you can use this technique to verify that p of n is true. Therefore, we've used these two steps to prove that for all n greater than or equal to zero, p of n is true. We now know why the principle of the mathematical induction works, but we have not yet seen how to formally implement the technique in a proof. So let's work through a formal induction proof example to see how to write such a proof. Let's revisit our example and prove that four evenly divides the number five to the n minus one for every natural number n. For our base case, we let n equals 0, the smallest natural number, then we can check that 5 to the 0 minus 1 is 0, which is 4 times 0, and 0 is an integer, so 4 evenly divides 5 to the 0 minus 1. The induction step is a universal statement, so we let n be a given fixed natural number greater than 0. Now we make a major assumption that 4 evenly divides 5 to the n minus 1 for this value of n. This means that we know that 5 to the n minus 1 is equal to 4 times k, where k is some integer. With this major assumption in hand, let's consider the quantity 5 raised to the n plus 1 minus 1. We can take this quantity, 
and we can rewrite it as 5 to the n plus 1 minus 5 plus 5 minus 1. We've added 0. We can then factor out a 5 so that we have 5 times 5 to the n minus 1 plus 5 minus 1, which simplifies to 5 to the 5 to the n minus 1 plus 4. Notice that 5 to the n minus 1 is exactly the quantity from our assumption, so we can replace 5 to the n minus 1 with the number 4 times k. And finally, we see that each of the two sum ends has a 4, so we can factor out a 4 to get 4 times 5 times k plus 1. Because k is an integer, the quantity 5k plus 1 is an integer, and thus 5 to the n plus 1 minus 1 is 4 times 5k plus 1, which is an integer, so that 4 evenly divides 5 to the n plus 1 minus 1. We proved both the base case and the induction step, so the process of mathematical induction guarantees that 4 evenly divides 5 to the n minus 1 for every value of n greater than 0. Now we're ready to verify the sum of squares formula inductively. The theorem we're interested in proving says for every natural number n, the sum of i squared, where i ranges from 0 to n, is equal to n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6. To begin, we verify with the base case. In this case, we let n equals 0, and then we plug this in so that the sum is just the sum of 0 squared, which is 0, and we can verify that this is in fact equal to 0 times 0 plus 1 times 2 times 0 plus 1 over 6, because the numerator in this fraction is 0. For the induction step, we let n be a given fixed natural number greater than or equal to 0. Then we make the major assumption that the sum of i squared, where i ranges from 0 to n, is equal to the quantity n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all over 6 for this particular value of n. Now let's consider the next term in the sequence, which is the sum of i squared, where i ranges from 0 to n plus 1. As we have seen before, the sequence of partial sums is recursive, so that the sum of i squared from 0 to n plus 1 is equal to the sum of i squared from 0 to n plus the last term, which is quantity n plus 1 squared. But now we notice that the term that's the sum of i squared, where i ranges from 0 to n, is actually the quantity from our major assumption. So we can replace this finite sum with the quantity n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6, and we still have plus n plus 1 squared. Getting a common denominator, we see the sum is this fraction, and we can simplify the numerator with some heavy algebra to see that the sum of i squared, where i ranges from 0 to n plus 1, is equal to n plus 1 times n plus 2 times 2n plus 3, all over 6. But if we reinterpret n plus 1, n plus 2, and 2n plus 3 in this way, we see that the sum of i squared, where i ranges from 0 to n plus 1, is equal to n plus 1 times the quantity n plus 1 plus 1 times the quantity 2 times n plus 1 plus 1, all over 6 is required. This completes the conditional proof required for the induction step, and thus the theorem holds by mathematical induction. Let's finish this video with a few comments about the proof we just completed by induction. An important thing to note is that the induction step is a conditional statement. You do not verify the hypothesis. Instead, the idea is to imagine that someone else has already verified the hypothesis for you for a fixed n. Then you use that major assumption to explain why the predicate then holds for the next number, which would be n plus 1. For example, in the sum of squares formula, we have a grid with width n times n plus 1 and height 2n plus 1. We don't actually verify that this equals 6 times the sum of i squared, where i ranges from 1 to n. We take it on faith that someone has already verified that for us. Now, if we are given 6 squares of the form n plus 1 squared, then we can take those squares and we can stack them around our assumed diagram like this. We can verify algebraically that now our stack has a width of length n plus 1 times n plus 2 and a height of size 2n plus 3. Therefore, 6 times n plus 1 squared added to the quantity 6 times the sum of i squared is equal to 6 times n plus 1 squared, and now we take it on faith that our sum is equal to n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1. Then the diagram in algebra above show that the sum we're interested in, which is 6 times the sum of i squared, where i ranges from 1 to n plus 1, must equal n plus 1 times n plus 2 times 2n plus 3. Of course, this only holds as long as the major assumption we used 
that 6 times the sum of i squared is equal to n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 also holds. We have not proved the formula necessarily, we have just proved a conditional statement. If one of the formulas holds, then the next formula holds. At this point, the technique of mathematical induction takes over, provided we prove one instance of the formula, in this case the base case, and then we get that cascade of modus ponens that guarantees that the formula is always true.